Hi, I'm Bill Perkins. Welcome to Compass TV. If you love the Lord, love your Bible, and love to learn, you're going to love this presentation. In 1859, Charles Darwin wrote his famous book, Origin of the Species. It taught that the world was not created in six days, but rather evolved over billions of years. Since the 1960s, the theory of evolution has been taught as fact by all secular colleges and universities, and even a large number of Christian colleges. But it's interesting that one of the things Darwin wrote in his book was that if his theory was correct, transitional fossils would be found confirming evolution. To date, not one transitional fossil has been found. Instead, fossils confirm the biblical story. Here's a fossil found at the top of 14,000 foot Mount Evans in Colorado. It's a fish fossil. There are tens of thousands of fish fossils found on the highest mountains all over the world. How did those fish fossils get on top of the highest mountains? Because the Bible explains there was a worldwide flood and that after the flood, the Lord raised the mountains and lowered the valleys. Those fish buried in the mud, stirred up by the volatile flood waters were simply raised up with the mountains. It's scientific evidences like this that prove science supports the accuracy of the Bible. Enjoy this presentation by one of the top creationists in America, Russ Miller, entitled, 50 scientific facts that make Darwin look silly. Thank you. How are you doing this morning? Super. Well, again, my name is Russ Miller, and I live in Flagstaff, Arizona. My wife, Joanna, and I, we have a ministry we feel God gave us to steward that we call Creation, Evolution, and Science Ministries. And we came up with this name because, well, sometimes we talk about creation and biblical accounts. And sometimes we talk about evolution and evolutionary accounts, including the foundation for evolution, uh, and that is, of course, billions of years of time. So we take all of these things and we compare them to the scientific evidence because for the last 50 years, our kids, and well, anyone under the age of 70, has been taught by our schools, by our colleges, and by our media that um, creation is a, reli a religious belief, which it is. But then they turn around and teach that evolution is science, which it's not. Think about this. Aren't creation and evolution, aren't they exactly the same thing? Aren't they beliefs on how we came about? Yeah, they're both beliefs on how we came about. Now, the Bible tells us to prove all things and hold fast that which is good. So that's what we're going to do this morning. We're going to take a look at the religious belief of Darwinian evolution. And we're actually going to compare that to some evidences. You see, real science is knowledge derived from the observation, study, and testing of evidence. Now, real science is a Christian's best friend. Real science will always support the Word of God. Never has one verse in Scripture been scientifically refuted. And so what we're going to do today is look at things you can test, study, and observe. Because it's not a matter of evidence, it's a matter of who gets to interpret that evidence. For instance, the Bible, although not a science book, being the true history book of the universe, says many things that you can actually compare to the evidence today. For instance, uh, number one, in 2 Peter, we're told there will come in the last days scoffers. Well, do we see scoffers today? Absolutely. The Bible's true word for word and cover to cover. Now, these scoffers like to say all sorts of crazy things. One of those things is that I won't believe the Bible unless you can scientifically prove it to be true. Well, someone said that to my wife, Joanna, a couple of weeks ago out at our resource table. And being the strong Christian evangelist that she is, she vaulted over the table and grabbed this man in a headlock and started twisting his nose back and forth and back and forth. And the man's nose started to bleed profusely. I got there just about that time to see what the commotion was. And she let the man go. And he said, Joanna, why did you do that to my nose? And she said, son, I just wanted to prove to you the Bible scientifically correct. Because in Proverbs, we're told that the ringing of the nose will bring it forth blood. <laughs> and you can test, study, and observe that one all day long, my friends. Well, Jesus said that Moses wrote of me. 
And Moses lays down the foundation for the gospel message in the first and third chapters of the first book of Scripture. You know, if you're going to build a house or a structure, the first thing you do is lay down the foundation, and that's exactly what God does with the book of Genesis. This is where we're told that God created a perfect universe. Think about this. It was perfect. There was no death. There was no evil. There was no suffering in it. It was perfect. Well, what in the world happened you know, have you ever heard scoffers ask you, where's your loving God? We live in a world full of death, evil, and suffering. Well, this is an important question today, and many people lose their faith because they don't know how to answer this question. In fact, a 10-year-old girl was killed in Phoenix, Arizona by a drunk driver, and this letter appeared in the uh, letters to the editor. It said, let the clergy explain what their so-called God's plan was for this poor child. This is proof positive there is no loving God. Well, where's the biblical answer? You know, I find that 9 out of 10 Christians don't know how to answer this. Well, the answer is right there in the book of Genesis. Think about this. God created a perfect universe. There was no death. There was no evil. There was no suffering in it. Well, what happened? Adam's original sin. Adam's original sin allowed death and evil to enter, corrupting the creation, and more importantly, separating us from our loving Creator. Now, this is the reason we need redemption. We need to be reunited with our Creator. In fact, the first promise of the coming Redeemer is found in Genesis 3, verse 15, where we're told the seed of the woman will bruise the head of the serpent. The seed of the woman? Wait a minute. The seed comes from the man. So what are we being told? We're being told that the coming Redeemer will be born of a virgin. And this is all laid down by Genesis 3, verse 15. That sets the foundation for the gospel of our loving God and Savior, born of the Virgin, Lord Jesus the Christ. Most of the rest of Scripture is God's plan of salvation through Jesus Christ. Now, Moses also told us that God has judged man's sin once already with a flood that covered all the high hills under the whole heaven. My friends, that's a global flood. Now, hey, let's be honest with ourselves. I mean, if, if God's word were really true, I mean, if there had really been a global flood, I mean, the evidence would be overwhelming. There should be nothing to even talk about. I mean, I would expect the outer crust of the earth would be made up of sedimentary layers of rock that had been laid down by water. I mean, if there had really been a global flood. And I'd expect those layers to be full of billions of dead things that were drowned and buried so quickly they didn't have time to rot away or get eaten by scavengers. Well, you know, real science, things you can test, study, and observe. What, what do we find today? Well, what we find is the outer crust of the earth averages a mile deep of sedimentary layers of rock laid down by water full of billions of dead things that we call fossils. My friends, that is exactly what would be there if the Word of God were true. And the Word of God is true, word for word and cover to cover. Jesus went on to warn that if you believe not Moses' writings, you're going to have trouble believing his words. Why is it important to believe Moses in order to believe Jesus? Well, the humanistic religious worldview, which has been taught as if it were science for the past 50 years in our schools and colleges, think about this. It's based on the exact same sedimentary layers of rock laid down by water. They just interpret it through their worldview. And they say, hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. Those layers of rock laid down by water didn't form in a flood. No, no, those layers of rock laid down by water formed slowly over billions of years of time. The layers are full of dead things, the fossils that were drowned and buried in the flood. That puts death before man's sin. Well, that means, and all old earth beliefs do this, by the way, no matter how well-intentioned you may think they are, Death before man means, hey, there was no original sin. There was no perfect creation corrupted by sin that allowed death into the world. And that means there was no separation, no need for redemption. I mean, think about this. The Bible begins, in the beginning God created. Jesus Christ says that man and woman were made since the beginning. Every, the Bible says man's sin brought death into the world. Every old earth belief... Everyone, I know many of you are struggling with these, say, no, no, Jesus, he didn't know what he was talking about. It was billions of years of death that brought man into the world. 
You know, we talked about false Christ earlier this morning. Please give that some thought. You know, Darwinists and, and atheists seem to understand this better than most Christians. This from the American Atheist magazine. Destroy original sin. And in the rubble, you will find the sorry remains of the Son of God. If Jesus was not the Redeemer who died for our sins, and this is what evolution means and old earth beliefs by putting death before man, then Christianity is nothing. And I agree with that statement 100%. If the Bible's not true, we don't need to mix secular atheist beliefs into God's Word. We can just go out and have brunch on Sunday. But I'm here to tell you God's Word is true, word for word and cover to cover. Is it important? Well, today, by the age of 20, almost 9 out of 10 Christian children leave the church. Well, they've just gone through 12 to 16 years of teachings that they evolved without God. We need to learn to stand up for the truth. We need to prove all things and hold fast to that which is good. So that's what we're about to do with regard to Darwinism. This is a Northern Arizona University textbook. I spoke there about four years ago, and they now have an accredited class attacking me and biblical creation. <laughs> for their final, they make fun of me for an hour and a half. Hey, I've been married 30 years. That doesn't bother me one iota. <laughs> I think Joanna's out in the hallway, so she didn't catch that. But here's what they teach. They say, kids, we focus on the scientific study of the origin of the human species, evolution. An enormous quantity of evidence supports evolution. Well, if, ev if evolution from a Darwinian standpoint had taken place, certainly the supporting evidence would be hard to deny. But realize this as we go into this. The study of our origins has never been about the evidence. We all have the exact same evidence. It's not a matter of Darwinists have their evidence and Bible-believing Christians have our evidence. We have the same evidence. Take those sedimentary layers of rock laid down by water. We all have the same evidence. I interpret layers of rock laid down by water through the biblical view. They form quickly in the global flood. The secular view is, oh no, they formed slowly over billions of years of death and suffering. So it's not a matter of who has the evidence, it's a matter of which philosophical framework, which worldview you interpret that evidence through. And there are really only two viable views out there. Either the world evolved on its own, like kids are taught in colleges and schools, etc., or God created the world and judged it with a global flood just like he says he did. Well, I live in Flagstaff, it's a college town, and well, they do have that group that says, well, maybe we're not here at all, maybe we just think we're here. <laughs> As a general rule, I don't worry about that group a whole lot. But the Bible does tell us, beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy, through worldview, and vain deceit after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Beware of man's philosophies. Now, realize that scientists, and there are about 200 different branches of science, now, a scientist is a person like everybody else. I'm sure we have several in the room today. And everybody has a religious belief. Yeah, whether you're a Bible-believing Christian or an atheist or anywhere in between, everyone has a religious belief. And whatever your religious belief is, it's going to bias how you interpret existing evidence. Well, remember, for the past 50-plus years, all of our kids have been taught that Earth formed four and a half billion years ago, and it started out as a big ball of hot rock, and then oceans formed as it rained on the rock for millions and billions of years of time. Let me ask you a question. Who saw the Earth form billions of years ago, and who saw it rain on the rock for millions of years? Nobody. That's a pure religious belief. I like to kid evolutionists and say, you guys think we evolved from a rock. And they, they, that gets them mad. Oh, no, we don't. Oh, really? We, you believe nothing blew up and a big rock formed. Where did we come from? Oh, yeah, you take it back far enough, they think we evolved from a rock. Now, <laughs> since scientists, if you had an interest in science as a kid, you were taught billions of years leading to evolution. So guess how you're going to interpret most evidence? Billions of years leading to evolution. Hey, let, let me show you how easy it is to be indoctrinated. No matter what the evidence is right in front of you, you have trouble seeing it. 
I'm going to show you a visual, and I want you all to participate. This is on, you're going to do this with yourself, but you need to say this out loud. Say this out loud, and you'll see what I'm talking about. Say the color, not the word. Go ahead. Say the color, not the word. We're so trained to say the word. And that's what happens when you get trained to do something one way. Even when the evidence is right in front of you, it's hard to come to the correct conclusion. So let's prove all things and hold fast that which is good. Real science is a Christian's best friend, such as the law of biogenesis, a principle of real biology. The law of biogenesis simply states that life only comes from already living matter. In other words, non-living matter like a rock and sterile water can't produce life. Darwinism can't get started. So to get over the scientific law of biogenesis, again, real science being the Christian's best friend, they teach that, well, the first life form was just a simple little single-cell creature like a paramecium or a bacteria. And they tell the kids, just right out of the textbook, all the many forms of life on earth today are descended, stated as a fact, are descended from a common ancestor found in a population of primitive unicellular organisms. Well, how's a kid supposed to argue with that? They've just been taught it's a fact. And what evidence do they produce? Well, it says right here, no traces of those events remain. <laughs> there is not a shred of evidence this took place, but they're being taught as a fact. In fact, from the Big Bang to the first start of life and the first cells, etc., this is a religious belief. You have to have pure, pure faith. It takes more faith to be an atheist or an evolutionist than it does to read God's Word and believe it. Now, if we start out as a simple little, let's say, bacteria cell, let's just take a brief look at a bacteria cell. They're run by tiny molecular motors called bacterial flagellum that allow the cell to swim around and perform its various functions. It can even change gears depending on how much weight it's towing or pushing. Now, it's made up of 40 different very complex proteins that have to be there complete and whole at the moment life started to form the flagellum and to create life. But to get the matter, make the matter even worse for Darwinists, it requires other molecular motors that also have to be there whole and at, at the very start of life to put the flagellum in order. You see, as real science, a Christian's best friend, gets into the cell, the more and more complex the cell becomes. There's nothing simple about life. So they're going to try to get kids to believe that scientists in labs have created life from non-life. Now, if you look at closely at these experiments, what you're going to find is they've come nowhere near creating life in the lab from non-living matter. Now, they've been able to create some non-living amino acids that are found in life. It'd be like you and I creating calcium. And because calcium is found in, in humans, saying we've created a human being. They've come nowhere near creating life in the lab. The law of biogenesis has never been known to have been overcome. In fact, one mathematician and molecular biologist calculated the odds of just one DNA chromosome arranging itself on its own in nature to being one in 10 to the 100 billionth power. Well, what kind of a number is that? Well, one in 10 to the 50th power is considered to be absolute zero. One in 10 to the 100 billionth. Um, in Arizona, we have a weekly lottery, and I'm not suggesting that you would play the lottery, but if you did, your odds of winning the state lottery every week, 52 weeks a year, for 27,000 years in a row is mathematically better than one DNA arranging itself on its own. <laughs> and Darwinists don't need one DNA, they need billions of DNA. So mathematically, Darwinism never could have gotten started. Think about it logically, the world's brightest scientific minds, building on years and years of millions of other scientists' observations and research, with billions of dollars of lab equipment and computers and salaries thrown in, cannot make non-living matter produce living matter. Yet we're supposed to believe rocks and seawater did it on their own. Oh, but not today when you could test, study, and observe it happening. No, no, it must have happened long ago and far away. I guess in the land of Oz. <laughs> now, at, in the class at NAU ta uh, attacking myself and biblical creation, they use a book put out by Eugenie Scott, the 
most, one of the most outspoken atheists in the world, no bias there, right? And she's the president of the National Center for Science Education, which is really just an evolutionary propaganda machine. So some kid gave me the book, and I flipped it open to see how she explained life starting on its own. And here's what she wrote in the book, Attacking Me and Creation. The origin of life was not a sudden event, but a <clears throat> continuum of events producing structures that are, well, <clears throat> alive with <clears throat> a lot of iffy stuff in the middle. <laughs> a lot of iffy stuff <laughs> in the middle. That's science for you, and that's a college textbook, my friends. I'm going to speak at NAU again next month, and we'll be discussing the iffy stuff. <laughs> now, this Nobel Prize winner uh, from Harvard University said, modern biologists, having reviewed the downfall of spontaneous generation, that's poof, life starting on its own, yet unwilling to accept creation, are left with nothing. He was wrong. They've got the iffy stuff. <laughs> you know, if you know, if you can just articulate the difference between micro and macro evolution, you can win a debate on any college campus around the globe from Oxford to Stanford to your local community college. And this is why Darwinists don't uh, debate anymore. Microevolution is a scientific fact. You need to realize the word evolution has many meanings, and Darwinists like to just flow from one to the other without identifying which is what because it fools people. Microevolution, it's best to take the word evolution out because it confuses the issue and call these microadaptations. Here are several examples of microadaptations right here. You know, dogs producing dogs. Dogs will bring forth after their kind. Roses, you can breed roses and get ones that do better in cold climates or warm climates. You can get red, uh, yellow, pink roses. But roses will only bring forth roses. Plants and or animals will only bring forth after their kind. These are micro changes, micro adaptations. So why is it important? In fact, why is it vital that Christians understand that kinds bringing forth after their kind is a scientific fact where you could show millions of examples? It's important that we understand this and we start teaching this to our kids because 10 times in the book of Genesis, we're told that plants and or animals will bring forth after their kind. And guess what is found today after millions of scientific experiments? Kinds will only bring forth after their kind. Just like we're told from Genesis chapter 1. Here's a scientific fact. If you remember this, no one can mess with you on the Darwinism issue. These biblically correct micro-adaptations result, think about this, from the sorting or the loss of the parent's gene pool. So you start out with the information and adaptations are caused by the sorting or loss of information, so the gene pools are getting weaker and weaker. This is a scientific principle called gene depletion. They're not getting better and better as Darwinists falsely teach. So kids are given lots of examples of biblically correct micro-adaptations, but then they switch the discussion to Darwinian macro-change, which would be a dog producing a non-dog, like a, like a peanut, a pine tree, a parrot, or a porpoise or something, and they fool people into thinking there's proof for Darwinism when there's never been a single example of Darwinism found. See, Darwinists focus the discussion on biblically correct micro change because there's no evidence of Darwinian macro to see. In fact, Darwin, you know, he's, he observed the various finches on the Galapagos, but these were just finches bringing forth finches after their kind, right? Yeah, he saw that the Bible was true, but he didn't interpret it properly. So they don't actually teach Darwinism in school anymore. Now they teach neo-Darwinism. Now this is based on three false assumptions. One, they say, hey, it's the mutations that add the new and beneficial genetic information. Mutations make things better. And then natural selection causes the mutant to take over the gene pool, given the magic ingredient millions and billions of years of time. They say given enough time, somehow a bacteria cell overcame all mathematical possibility and the law of biogenesis and then mutated its way to everything on Earth, including you and I. And if you want to believe you're the ultimate mutation, well, that's between you and Jesus. I say we are made in the image of God just like the Word of God tells us. 
Here's a problem for neo-Darwinism. After millions of scientific observations, mutations are also caused by the sorting or loss of genetic information. Gene depletion applies to mutations just like it does adaptations. Now, realize natural selection is a scientific fact. You could show millions of examples. I call it God's quality assurance program. I mean, think about this. Things are losing information and losing information. If they continued losing information unchecked, in about a 1,000 years, all gene pools would be corrupted and everything would go extinct. Well, what keeps things from going extinct? They lose too much information. They get removed from the gene pool by God's quality assurance program, natural selection. Yet here's a textbook telling kids that natural selection causes evolution. Natural selection doesn't have anything to do with evolution. And if it did, it would prevent it from taking place. So students up to the PhD level of biology are being falsely taught that mutations plus natural selection lead to neo-Darwinian change. But in real science, a Christian's best friend, here's how I show people how to destroy Darwinism in four seconds flat. Start your watch. Gene depletion plus natural selection makes Darwinism a scientific impossibility. It never happened because it is scientifically impossible. And real science is a Christian's best friend. But watch out for false science. False science is a different story. Speaking of which, Darwin's book came out in 1859. The Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection, that's all we're told today, or the, or the subtitle, The Preservation of Favored Races in the Struggle for Life. Well, 10 years after Darwin's book came out, they had the same problem they have today. There, there wasn't any evidence to show anybody. So Ernst Haeckel, he invented some, which Darwinists are very famous for doing, and he came up with a theory of recapitulation, the Biogenetic law. That sounds pretty impressive, doesn't it? Kids, ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. Well, how's a kid supposed to argue with that, right? <laughs> I'm going to show you his drawings from left to right across the top of a human in the embryonic stage and some other creatures. Notice the drawings left to right across the top look the same. He, he took them and he labeled them chickens, salamander, fish, etc. The actual photos are below. They don't look like his drawings. And what Hegel had done, and this was proven in the 1870s, was he took a human in the embryonic stage and drew copies with very slight changes and labeled them all these other creatures and came up with the theory of recapitulation. Ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. That means basically you go through your past evolutionary stages while you're in your mother's womb. Proven fraud in the 1870s and still taught in colleges today. And fraud in the 18th century and 19th century is still fraud in the 21st century. Now here's a modern version. They say, hey, look, here's a human in the embryonic stage, looks just like a chicken. But they've taken a nice orange crayon and colored it in. I mean, is that how you prove evolution? You take a box of crayons and make colored pictures? And look, they say, look, you have gill pouches or gill slits. My friends, you never had gill pouches. You never had gill slits. You never had gills. You never went through a fish phase. These are folds in the skin that later develop into organs in the throat and the neck area. Have you ever heard that you're 98% the same in your biochemistry as a chimpanzee? Proving that there are close evolutionary relatives? Well, you know, for a fact, if genetic similarities prove evolution, they should also be teaching that we evolve from earthworms because you're 75% the same as an earthworm in your biochemistry. Yeah, your biochemistry is 50% the same as a banana. <laughs> Anyone evolve from a banana? I saw a couple of hands go up out there. When I asked this at college, last time I spoke on a college campus, 500 people raised their hand, and the sad thing was they were serious because that's what they've been taught. Actually, though, this from several years ago, seven years ago, Nature Magazine reported at least a 7.7% difference. They've got that down to 92%. It's getting lower and lower as real science gets into the genome. Well, think about this. You're comprised of about 80 trillion cells. 
Now, these are numbers beyond our comprehension. Uh, if I had time, I'd go into some, some analogies. But each one of your 80 trillion cells contain 3 billion base pairs of genetic information. You know, forming structures, which Darwinists can't even show, that's not even the tip of the iceberg for their problem. Their problem is where did the information come from? A 7.7% difference would require 231 million beneficial information-adding mutations to take place, to just to change a chimp into a human, much less a bacteria to everything in, on the globe. And real science can't show any viable examples of mutations adding appreciable amounts of new and beneficial genetic information. Now, they've got a lot of frauds, and I cover those in other teachings. In fact, uh, this from a year ago from Nature magazine. They say there's at least a 30% difference between chimp and human Y chromosomes. A 30% difference. Real science, a Christian's best friend. If they're going to teach similarities prove evolution, they should teach we evolved from sunflowers. Our cytochrome C is closest to that from a sunflower. Our eyes are close to those from the octopus. Our skin is close to that from pigs. Your hemoglobin structure is close to that from root nodules. Anyone evolve from a root nodule? I saw a couple more hands go up. You guys are worrying me up there in the upper deck. Have you ever heard that, let's say, uh, a bacteria becoming resistant to antibiotics or insects becoming resistant to insecticides as proof they're evolving bigger and better? Well, why are they so desperate? I mean, this has nothing to do with the evolution of new kinds with new and beneficial genetic information. Let's just take uh, cockroaches, for example. Let's say I had a 1,000 cockroaches right here on the stage, and they were running toward the front row, but I sprayed them with insecticide. And let's say it killed 998 of them, but two survived. Did those two instantaneously evolve an immune system? Of course not. They already had the gene in their gene pool that allowed them to survive that particular poison. The others didn't have that gene and were killed off. Now their offspring of the two survivors will inherit that immune gene and the new populations immune to the poison. They evolved nothing. That's proof of our intelligent biblical designer who put a wide range in our gene pool so we could adapt microadaptations to different climates and conditions and not go extinct. Here's another NAU textbook. It shows kids a drawing of a flipper of a whale or the bones of the, of the foreleg of a cat or a horse or a dog and the forearm of a human. And they say, look, kids, we all have two bones in our forelimbs, proof we evolved from a common ancestor. Now, I will say this. This is the best proof I've ever seen of Darwinism. This is their number one proof in my opinion. However, couldn't I also claim that they're similar because they have the same designer? Yeah, I drive a Chevy pickup truck, and my next-door neighbor drives a Chevy van, and their dashboards are identical. <laughs> it's not because they evolved from a skateboard. <laughs> it's because they had the same designer. Why not teach kids both views, and they can decide which makes the best sense? Now, this textbook says we have proof of evolution from the fossil record. And they show these evolutionary trees of life in the textbooks. And at the base, they, they've typed in the word invertebrate ancestor. And then they've taken a box of crayons, and from the typed in word invertebrate ancestor, they draw colorful lines connecting it to everything on Earth. Do you see any evidence of Darwinian evolution in front of you there? No. Yeah, for that to be science, each one of those colorful lines would need to be made up of millions of transitional fossils as one kind slowly evolved into the other. Take some, taking a box of crayons, if I drew a nice orange line from my laptop to the front row, that wouldn't mean the folks sitting in the front row evolved from my laptop. <laughs> why, don't they, why don't they get the frauds out of the textbooks and just bring in the real evidence for Darwinism? They don't have any. Gene depletion and natural selection show it's a scientific impossibility. It never happened. Yet this book says we have evidence uh, from the fossil record. We've got Archaeopteryx, the missing link between reptiles and birds. 
Well, they said, and this was uh, actually found in 1861, two years after Darwin's book came out. So 150 years now, they've been teaching Archaeopteryx was the size of a pigeon, had claws on its wings, proving it's a reptile becoming a bird. Well, the Hoytzin in South America is about the size of a pigeon. He has, you know, claws on his wings. No one's claiming he's a missing link of any sort. Uh, 20 years ago, they found modern bird fossils below the layer that had Archaeopteryx in it. Well, remember, they say the layers formed slowly over millions of years. That would put the modern bird before Archaeopteryx. How could it be a missing link? And even more daunting from a scientific standpoint is that reptile DNA does not have the genetic information to produce feathers, which are very complex structures. And just recently, now they're starting to say, you know what, we were wrong. Archaeopteryx is not the link between uh, dinosaurs and, and reptiles and birds. Now they're claiming he was a dinosaur. <laughs> Unbelievable. Here's the whale evolution series. This first creature is an extinct land mammal. He had nothing to do with water, maybe drank some every now and then. But Ambulocetus is a work of evolutionary art. He's the supposed missing link. Now here are the bones found of Ambulocetus, the black bones were found in a different strata layer in a different location. They're not even from the same creature. Uh, there's no pelvic girdle. They don't know if he ran, swam, flew, or what, but they put the bones together, come up with about 20% of a skeleton, and that's supposedly the great missing link. And Basilosaurus, he's actually 10 times that size. But if they drew him to scale, he wouldn't fit the propaganda, would he? Hmm. Have you ever seen the horse evolution series? Now, this is supposedly the ancient horse at the bottom in the strata layers leading up to the modern horse. Now, this was first invented in the 1870s. The fossils of the horses have never been found in the order depicted. In fact, the modern horse at the top, which is supposedly the last one to evolve, he's been found in strata layers below the ancient horse. <laughs> and even if this had been real and it's not, wouldn't these just be horses producing horses? Micro adaptations? Absolutely. Here's another one of their great drawings. Have, have you noticed another thing? You, you notice all their proofs are drawings? Yeah, Darwinists are experts at drawing things that never existed to support their theory that never took place. <laughs> so this, they've drawn the lobe fin fish, and the story goes the lobe fin couldn't swim, so he walked around the bottom of the ocean on his lobe fins, and he got bored one day climbed out on land and became an amphibian. Hey, what a story that is. The problems are many. First of all, the amphibian has feet, toes, shoulders, claws, elbows, a skeletal system, a muscular system, and a central nervous system to control all those changes. And real science, a Christian's best friend, knows of no way for nature to add any new and beneficial genetic information, much less the millions of pieces that this would require. In fact, a low fin, which they say has been extinct for 325 million years, has been found alive today. And he doesn't walk around on the bottom of the ocean. He's a very good swimmer. And the fossilized version that they claim is 300 plus million years old looks just like the living version. In other words, there's no evolution found in the fossil record. See, all those layers of rock laid down by water were laid down by water just a few thousand years ago fitting the biblical worldview to a T. So, to try to explain why they've got no evidence, well, back in 1930, Richard Goldschmidt came up with what he called the hopeful monster theory. And basically, this states where there's, there's no evidence in the fossil record because, well, evolution ha happened like overnight. Maybe reptiles laid eggs and birds popped out. A male and a female bird, so they could carry on with no evidence left behind. Well, <clears throat> everybody was laughing at the hopeful monster theory. So 50 years later, in the, around 1980, world-famous evolutionist uh, Stephen Gould of Harvard and Niles Eldridge changed hopeful monster just slightly, but gave it a much more scientific-sounding name. If a kid asks a professor today, Professor, why is there no evidence for evolution? They're going to be told, punctuated equilibrium. Don't you know anything? Well, basically, punctuated equilibrium states that, well, there's no evidence because evolution happened in a short spurt of time and then a long period, they call it stasis, with no evolution, and then a short spurt of evolution and a long period with no change. And no evidence was captured in the fossil record.
You see, they claim the fossil record proves evolution. That's 100% bluff and bluster. The fossil record is an enemy. In fact, real science is an enemy to the religious fairy tale of Darwinism. In fact, so anyways, it's not just me telling you they've got no evidence. They've got a theory to explain what? Why they've got no evidence. They've got no evidence. But I thought science was knowledge derived from the study of evidence. You see, Darwinism is a religious belief that we've taught in our schools to our children for 50 years now as if it were science. Hmm. I think that's a serious issue. You might be thinking, well, come on, Russ, what about the ape men? I mean, we've all seen the ape men. You know, the hominids, the closest link between ape and man. Here's a new textbook showing humans connected everything on earth with a nice red line. I mean, what more for proof could you want than a red line? Look, they even have us connected to jellyfish. Unbelievable. And what's their evidence? Oh, punctuated equilibrium, I forgot. Let's look at some of the great hominids that have fooled billions of people into rejecting Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. This was a great Piltdown man. He was found around 1910, and for 45 years, he misled not millions, billions of people into rejecting Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And then finally in the mid-1950s, it was proven these jokers had taken the skull cap from a human, the jawbone from an orangutan, filed them down to fit together, acid treated both sides, buried them in a rock quarry in Piltdown, England, and came along and dug up Piltdown Man and spent the rest of their lives as world-renowned evolutionists and misled billions of people into rejecting Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. In fact, Piltdown Man is probably the biggest reason. So many people were misled, we finally allowed creation and prayer to be ripped from our schools and in 1963 started teaching our future citizens they evolved without God. You want to know what's wrong in this society today, you just turn it back to 1963. Nebraska man, now all was found in Nebraska man was a piece of a broken tooth. But Darwinists are very creative. From that broken tooth, they reconstructed Nebraska man, his family, and even the tools they would have worked with. <laughs> from a piece of broken tooth. It was later proven that the tooth came from an extinct pig. Yeah, here's the real Nebraska man right there. <laughs> Now, Lucy's been the Messiah for evolution for the last 37 years or so. Even though they've known for 35 years it was just an ape, stood about three and a half feet tall, drug its knuckles on the ground. These are the original bones found. And they said they know it's a missing link becoming human because, well, the, the thigh bone, the femur, has to angle the hook up with the knee. Well, humans, we all have angled thigh bones. Well, what they forgot to mention was almost all tree-dwelling apes have angled femurs. No evolution there. They say, well, the knee was slightly bigger than a normal ape's knee, proving it's becoming human. Well, you know, we all have different sized knees. If you took a knee joint of everybody in this room, they'd all be different sizes, right? Yeah, well, they also forgot to mention the knee joint was found a mile away, 210 feet deeper in the straddle layer. <laughs> yeah, if that was Lucy's knee, I want to see the airplane that hit that monkey. It must have been going right through those treetops, I tell you. <laughs> Wow, what a miracle. <laughs> this from uh, 25 years ago. Anatomists have concluded these creatures are not a link between ape and man and did not walk upright like a human being. Other fossils have been found. These are called Australopithecus afarensis. They had curved toes and curved fingers for grabbing onto tree limbs with. Yet here's a modern textbook showing Lucy walking perfectly upright like a human with her little fingers like they're pondering a tough decision. And look at the feet, perfectly normal human feet, pure fraud, pure propaganda. Why don't they take out the frauds and the misleading evidence and why don't they just put in the real evidence? They don't have any. It never happened. It's the biggest misleading fraud in the history of the world along with, of course, billions and millions of years of time. So now they've got Tomei man, and they said it's older than any hominid known, making their finders world-famous evolutionists. You notice how their finds are either the oldest one or the youngest one? So you've got to find the oldest or the youngest to be famous, see? However, when they found it in 2002, Nature magazine said this is just an ape. When they found it in 2002, Science News said the specimen's teeth 
resemble apes. It didn't walk on two legs, so they wait six years, and they put it in the textbooks as our closest missing link. And, you know, I can make this stuff look stupid, but I'm not in those classrooms, am I? And kids are buying this hook, line, and sinker. Flat-faced man is another one of the new ones. Uh, what was found was a small skull crushed in about 50 pieces, so the finders reconstructed it. Now, after they put it together, they said, you know, the face is slightly flatter than a normal ape's face, proving it's becoming human, and in the textbooks it goes. What they left out of the textbooks was flat-faced man stood about three feet tall, and that's our closest missing link. Think about it logically with millions of various apes and monkeys having lived and died over the last, oh, 500 years alone. Why does finding a monkey bone prove evolution? Doesn't it just prove that when monkeys die, they leave their bones behind? <laughs> Yet here's a new textbook showing humans connected all sorts of things and primates like the tarsier connected by a nice colorful line. We're related to the tarsier? Grandma, what big eyes you've got. <laughs> Dwayne Gish defines Darwinism as a sustenance of fossils hoped for, the evidence of links unseen. <laughs> Five years ago, this Nobel Prize winning scientist stated, anything we science can do to weaken the hold of religion should be done, and that includes lying, cheating, and filling textbooks full of frauds. And in case you think he's brilliant, and I'm sure he is in his given field of study, he doesn't even realize he's pushing his religious belief. If he wants to destroy a religion, religious belief, start with his own. You know, I think if we're going to use frauds to promote Darwinism, I think we can do a little bit better job, don't you? I know I could. I actually have the first missing link. I've overcome punctuated equilibrium, law of biogenesis, and everything. Would you like to see my missing link? No one has seen these before because they live in the treetops in Flagstaff, Arizona, those big ponderosa pines, and they only come out after dark. But I happen to find some, and here he is. I call this the golden finch retriever. <laughs> So who thinks I'm going to be a world-renowned evolutionist any day now? I guess I better just stay in the ministry then. The Bible says, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. We can all be fooled. And they've changed the glory of the uncorruptible God, which I think today is his creation, into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. I think it could change creation into the fairy tale of Darwinian evolution. They're talking about idolatry here, and this is the highest form of idolatry to think you're the most evolved, you are your own God. But a review of Darwinism versus real science will show you that the law of biogenesis means it never could have started. No one has ever seen anything Darwinian macro evolve. The fossil record shows no missing links that will stand up to scrutiny. We don't see half this, half that flopping around on earth today. The first and the second laws of thermodynamics say Darwinism is scientifically impossible. Mathematical probability says it never could have happened. And gene depletion plus natural selection make Darwinism a scientific impossibility. That's why they can't find any evidence. It's not because of hopeful monsters. It's not because of punctuated equilibrium. And it's not because the evidence is lost in the iffy stuff. It's because it never happened, pure and simple. Yet millions of kids around the country and the world will be taught next week. It's a fact that life on earth has evolved. And with no real evidence, how do they get this to take over our, our schools, our, our society, our sciences? It depends on immense length of time. Billions of years of time is the foundation for Darwinism which is the foundation for modern naturalism and the foundation for secular humanism. We're talking about four religious beliefs. And because the church is compromising with old earth beliefs, putting death before Adam, we can't stand up for the truth. In fact, 99% of churches block my information. Unbelievable. And I cover the age of the earth very succinctly in our teaching an old earth or a global flood. And I show where the isotope dating methods get their dates from so you will understand that a global flood destroys every old earth belief. And then I show overwhelming evidence of that flood. 
But the teaching of Darwinism is simply humanistic indoctrination, which is undermining scientific research, education, and the faith of billions of people. The Bible says, prove all things and hold fast that which is good. And the purpose of this ministry is to teach about creation, evolution, and age of the earth issues, to expose false anti-biblical teachings, and to provide a reason for the hope that's in the heart of all true believers and all true seekers. Our if the foundations be destroyed show this. Creation is not only foundational to the gospel, it's foundational to America's freedoms. As an American, where do your freedoms come from? You're endowed by your creator. We've been teaching the last 50 years of our kids, there's no creator. Do you see the problem? Jesus said, the harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore that the Lord of the harvest will send forth laborers. Let me end with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for uh, the Compass International. I thank you for Bill Perkins and his efforts to get truth to folks. And I thank you for every dear soul that's here today. And I hope and I pray the information that we shared will be eye-opening and will keep us on that narrow path that leads to that, that straight gate into heaven with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's in his great name I do pray. Amen. This has been 50 Facts That Make Darwin Look Silly, presented by Russ Miller. To receive a free catalog of over 250 awesome Bible studies on DVD or CD, all using and defending a literal translation of the Bible, information on upcoming Bible conferences in your area, or details of our missionary outreach and trips to Israel, call Compass at 1-800-977-2177, 24 hours a day, or visit us on the web at compass.org.